And you know, tonight is special. Uh, we have a big subject that we're going to look at, but that's, that's true every night. We always have a big subject that we're going to look at. But tonight is special because on Wednesday we studied about one of those commandments that was written in stone, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. And uh, something I didn't mention is that according to the Bible, the uh, days the, of the week when God made it in Genesis 1, it says the evening and the morning were the first day. So the day actually began in the evening, and so the Sabbath begins in the evening, or we could look other places, uh, Mark 1, 32, for instance, talks about an evening when the sun did set. And so the biblical Sabbath actually begins in about half an hour, 20 minutes or something, when the sun sets on Friday and then goes until Friday until sunset on Saturday. And I believe there's an important reason for that. First of all, I've taught and shared the Bible in places of the world where there's I know you can't believe this, but there's no internet, <laughs> and there's not even electricity. Now, I do have to say, they're starting to get cell phones there. They don't have electricity, but they have cell phones, and you charge it up if you go and you pay uh, somebody that has a little business, and they have a solar, uh, a solar uh, charging station there that you can charge your phone for a little bit. So they're starting to get those. But... You know what? People don't have watches. They don't have clocks. How do you tell when a new day begins? How do you tell when the Sabbath begins? Sun comes up. If the sun, when the sun goes down, it, you don't have to have a clock. You don't have to be, you can be so poor you don't have a watch. And you can still know when the Sabbath begins, right? And something else. I imagine that if, when we're preparing for the Sabbath, We'd prepare all the way until midnight if it began at midnight. And then we'd be tired the next morning. And so God gives us a full night of rest by the sun. When the sun sets, the Sabbath begins, a full night of rest. And then we can worship him on the Sabbath. Anyway, that's why it's special. And one reason it's special tonight, because it's going to become the Sabbath pretty soon. And I'm thankful for that. But let's go ahead and let's begin with prayer. And uh, as I said, we've got a big subject. I don't know how we're going to get through it all, and I hope we can, but we're going to do our best. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful that you have brought us together again. Thank you that we can learn from your word. We, have, we know that you have a message for us from prophecy. And so we just pray that you will bless us as we study together now, that you will be our teacher and guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as Pastor Giancarlo mentioned, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, we're going to be talking about Revelation's rapture. We won't be here. We'll be in the sanctuary right over there. Um, and you just go down the hall to get there. It's not hard to get to. So Revelation's rapture, there's a lot of talk about the rapture. Well, it's important for us to understand from prophecy. In fact, if we don't understand what the Bible talks about the rapture and things like this, it's hard to understand a lot of the other prophecies. So an important subject we're going to be looking at tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, Revelation's final countdown. What is this final countdown of Bible prophecy? Sunday night, we're looking at Revelation's book of books, no meeting Monday. Tuesday night, we look at voices from the dead. How do we understand what the Bible talks about death? Wednesday night, we look at 1,000 years of peace, wonderful prophecy that puts together uh, a lot of the prophecies of Revelation as well. But tonight, we are looking at Revelations or the attack of Antichrist. You know, I mentioned on Wednesday, we studied about the Sabbath, right, or the fourth commandment. And when we, there's a question that comes to our mind when we think about that, and that question, no doubt, is... Who changed the Bible Sabbath, right? We looked, we looked last night, or not last night, Wednesday night, and we saw that from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible talks about the seventh-day Sabbath. And so why is that not being recognized today in a larger way? Who changed the Bible Sabbath? And so I want to begin with a story, though, and then we're going to get into that study, and we're going to be studying primarily from Daniel 7 as we look at the attack of Antichrist. Their story goes, and you're familiar with this story, but the story goes that there was this 
Greek, this Greek princess, Helen. And she was kidnapped and taken to another city in Greece, to Troy. And according to the story that uh, comes down to us, and it's a legend story, we're not sure what part, what is what, but here we find they kept her there for 10 years in the city of Troy. Now you can imagine, that's a long time to be taken hostage, isn't it? And the Greeks were battling to get her back, and for 10 years they were fighting and battling and They couldn't conquer the city of Troy. Their princess was still there in Troy. And so they got an idea. Since we couldn't conquer with our force of money, maybe we can conquer with stratagem. And so off in the distance where they couldn't be seen by the citizens of Troy, they began to build a gigantic horse. And then they brought this horse to the city of Troy and they said, we're tired of fighting. Here, your gods are greater than ours, so we're bringing this offering for your gods. And here's this gigantic horse. And so the citizens of Troy were so happy, they brought this horse in and they were rejoicing because finally the war's over, right? Right? Of course, there was one older man, as the story goes, that said, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. But the majority overruled them, and as the majority overruled them, they brought this in, and at night, guess what happened? Through a trap door, the soldiers came out and opened the city gates, and the army came back in and conquered the city of Troy overnight in what they were not able to do for 10 years before that. And of course, that's where we get the Trojan horse from. And the question we're asking tonight is, could there be a Christian Trojan horse? Could there be a Trojan horse that has come into Christianity and many times we don't even realize this Trojan horse that has come in? We know there's been an attack upon God's law and as we begin with that question, who changed the Bible Sabbath? We know that God didn't change the Bible Sabbath. Why? Because in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, I, what? Do not change. So God didn't change the Bible Sabbath. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? We know that Jesus didn't change the Bible Sabbath. Why? Because in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus, it says Jesus Christ is the same when? Yesterday, today, and, and forever, right? So Jesus doesn't change. We know that the disciples or the apostles didn't change the Bible Sabbath. Why? Because it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to, what does it say? Obey God rather than men. And so God didn't change the Bible Sabbath. Jesus didn't change the Bible Sabbath. The apostles didn't change the Bible Sabbath. So obviously the question is, who did, right? And so we're turning to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 tonight Now, we've already studied quite a bit from the book of Daniel. We saw in Daniel chapter 2 that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Do you remember his dream? We have it right over here, right? His, this great dream, this metal man, a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron, and of clay. And these represented the four different kingdoms, right? Now, Tonight we're going to be studying, though, not about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but we're going to be studying about Daniel's dream. And Daniel had a dream, not of a metal man, but of four great beasts that came up from the sea. Let's read it. Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. 
So here we find that Daniel is dreaming and he sees the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea most likely here, and the winds are blowing upon it, stirring it up. And as the winds are blowing upon it, stirring it up, there's four great beasts that come up one after the other. Now, what does this mean? Now, you remember, we already laid some prophetic foundation on probably our first night that we were together. Bible prophecy is given in, do you remember what it's given in? Symbols, isn't it? Bible prophecy is given in symbols. And what do we allow to explain those symbols? The Bible. So let's look at these prophetic symbols. Our first symbol is water, because they were coming up from the great sea, right? So what does the water represent? Revelation 17, verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so when we see the water, what does the water represent? The water represents lots of people, right? Peoples, multitudes, civilizations, tongues. But then we have the wind. We won't look up this verse, but in Jeremiah 51, 1, 23, 19, and some other places, it talks about how winds are destroying winds, destructive winds. So winds represent strife or war. Now, when we think about that, and we have, you know, if a tornado comes, that's a destroying wind, isn't it? Hurricane is a destroying wind, isn't it? And so wind is representing strife, war, or destruction. But we have another representation here, or another uh, symbol, and that is a beast. What does a beast represent? Well, a beast represents a kingdom. Let's read it, Daniel 7, verses 17 and 23. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So when we look back, we see there's Daniel sees the wind blowing the great sea and then, wa and then beast coming up from the sea. And so Daniel sees strife and war, lots of people, and then one kingdom after another, these four great beasts coming up. Now let's look at them. Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. The first was like a, what does it say? A lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So here we have a, the first beast. What was the first beast? A lion. But what did this lion have? Wings, didn't it? It has wings like an eagle. And then it stood up and all of this. Now, what does that represent? What does the lion represent? Now, if we just stop and think about it a little bit, in Daniel chapter 2, over here, we had how many kingdoms represented here? Four kingdoms. And now in Daniel chapter 7, we have how many animals? Four animals. And what do the beasts represent? Kingdoms. kingdoms, right? So we have four animals representing four, kingdom, four kingdoms. In Daniel 2, we had four different metals representing four different kingdoms. Do you think there might be a connection or a similarity here? Yeah, absolutely. And then we look at the head of gold and the lion is like a lion and gold. Is there similarity there? I mean, one's an animal and one's, uh, and one's a metal, but they're kind of gold is a very rich and precious metal and a lion is called the king of beasts, right? We also have in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7 and 13, referring to Babylon, it says, the lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of nations is on his way. And his chariots, like a whirlwind, his horses are swifter than, what does it say? Eagles. Very interesting. Swifter than eagles and a lion out of the thicket, referring to Babylon. And so this first kingdom, as in Daniel 2, the first kingdom represented what? Babylon. And so here in Daniel 7, the first kingdom, the first beast here, represents Babylon. We've already talked about Babylon a little bit. Here's another picture of the ruins of Babylon. But I want to notice something very fascinating here. This is a lion. Its face and everything is worn off. But this is from archaeological Babylon. And notice this lion there that was lining the gates. And notice if you can see a little bit of that curve there, that appears to be a wing on 
the lion. Very interesting. This was something Daniel was very familiar with. But not only that, here's the Ishtar Gate in Berlin, the museum there in Berlin. Beautiful gate here. But notice what is there. What do we have here? A lion. But notice the mane is a little bit different. What else do you see going back there? It's a wing, a winged lion. So the winged lion was something very familiar to Babylon. Daniel was very familiar with it. It was on the gates. There were statues made of these winged lions. And so it was clear that this winged lion was representing Babylon. Now, what did the wings represent that said swifter than eagles, right? If you need to go somewhere fast, how do you go? Do you drive or do you fly? You fly, right? So flying is speed, equated with speed, isn't it? Or we might say, he was just flying down the road. What do we mean? He was, he was going really fast, wasn't he? And so here we have going fast equated with speed and flying. So here, Babylon quickly came to power, had two wings like an eagle. Let's keep going. Daniel chapter 7, verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a, what does it say? A bear. It was raised up on one side, and there had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. So here we have a bear. Now this bear is raised up on one side, and it has three ribs in between its mouth, or in its mouth. What is the nation that conquered Babylon? Persia, right? Persia conquered Babylon. And interesting, Persia conquered three provinces. Babylon, Lydia, what we call Turkey today, and Egypt. And so when we look at that, it conquered three. That sounds like three ribs in its mouth, doesn't it? Now, if we were to go to Daniel chapter 8, which we're going to study more tomorrow night, but when we look at Daniel chapter 8, we see another animal representing uh, Persia as well, and it says it had two horns, and the higher horn came up last. Persia was the, does this say, yeah, it has Medo-Persia here. So Medo-Persia is the longer name. It was the Medes and the Persians that were united together, but the higher power came up last and became stronger. So the bear with one side that was raised up, probably representing Persia, that became stronger. But let's keep going. Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. After this I looked and there was another like, what does it say? A leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So we had Babylon then we had Medo-Persia. What comes next? Greece, right? And so we have Greece coming next. Greece uh, under Alexander the Great. Now, when you look at a leopard, what's the characteristic of a leopard? You know, a, 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 it's fast, right? So when you look at the lion, the lion is kingly, isn't it? Royal. Babylon was kingly and royal. A bear is strong. Medo-Persia was strong. A leopard is fast, right? Greece was fast. And not only is a leopard fast, how many wings did it have on its back? Four wings. If two wings represented speed, this is a leopard with four wings. This is a supersonic leopard, isn't it? And that's exactly what Alexander the Great was. This is the territory, and if you look there, you can see all the different areas that he went. For about, he conquered the known world in like 10 years, and on average, he marched something like 10 miles a day every day for about eight or nine years that he was, uh, was moving. That's extremely fast for that day and age. He didn't have fighter jets and all this type of stuff that we have today. So when he had a cavalry and foot infantry, that was very, very fast. Now, there's another aspect here. How many heads did this leopard have? Four heads. Why do you think this leopard had four heads? Well, when we look at what happened, Alexander the Great, he was afraid that his father was going to conquer the whole world and he wouldn't have anything left to conquer. And uh, so he, his dad died when he was fairly young, 18 or 19, and 
Then he was told by his counselors, stay home, have a family, have some children so that there'll be heirs after you. Alexander the Great was having none of that. He wanted to conquer the world. So he started in Macedonia, went to Greece, then crossed over to Turkey and Asia Minor, that area, and then went to Egypt and through Jerusalem. And there's all sorts of history, and you can see the arrows that he went. But he died at age 33. Probably he drunk himself to death and got a fever after that. You read about it, it is terrible, some of the things that happened. But on his deathbed, there's a couple different accounts. So whatever, uh, we don't know exactly which account it was according to which historian you read. But one account is that as he's on his deathbed, his generals gathered around him, that's all he had, and said, to whom does the kingdom go? And he says, reported to have said, to the strongest. Now what does that do to a bunch of generals? Well, they all start fighting one another, don't they? Well, it turns out that there were basically four major generals, and then actually it went down to two, but basically it was four in the beginning. Well, it was ten in the beginning, but then it whittled down to four. Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Aren't you glad you didn't have to say those names? <laughs> So they were about in these ter this territory here. Cassander was in Macedonia, Lysimachus there in uh, Asia, Ma in Turkey area. Seleucus had most of that, uh, the eastern side. Ptolemy had Egypt. And so when we look at this, isn't prophecy just fascinating? How it gives us these details. A leopard, a fast leopard with four wings and then four heads, and we look in history and we can see how it takes place just like God said. I just love this prophecy because it's so clear as we look back on it today. But we want to keep going because this prophecy is not just for back then. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. What is this beast? What is this animal like? Yeah, John didn't, or Daniel didn't even know. He said just this dreadful and terrible beast, right? Huge iron teeth. Does that remind us of Daniel 2 anywhere? Huge iron teeth. What's the fourth kingdom here in Daniel chapter 2? It was Rome, and it was legs of what? Legs of iron, wasn't it? And so you see the connections here, very clear connections. But this was different. What was this beast all about? Why is it talking about this? Well, we know it was Rome. We know the time of Rome and all of that. And so then there was a division in Daniel chapter 2. By the way, well, we're going to get to it. We have here these different, these different metals in Daniel chapter 2, and we have the same kingdoms but animals here in Daniel chapter 7. But this fourth beast, we're going to get more detail, and as it's going to give us more detail, it's going to help us to understand something very important here. Because this beast, not only did it have huge iron teeth and this dreadful and terrible beast, but what did it have on its head? Ten horns on its head. So what were these ten horns representing? Well, I don't have it up on the screen, so we're going to read it from the Bible. Daniel chapter 7, and what's on the screen is just copied from the Bible. But Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And so these horns represent the division of Rome into ten kings or ten kingdoms. That makes sense? And so we have divided Europe for the divided world. And so when we look at this, we see that very shortly, well, not shortly, Rome lasted for 500 years, but from 351 to 476 AD, Rome was dividing up, and guess how many tribes Western Rome divided up into? Ten kingdoms. What were these tribes? Well, you had the Alamanni, which became Germany, the Franks, which were France, the Burgundians, which became Switzerland, Suivi, which became Portugal, the Lombards, which became Italy, the Visigoths, which became S Spain, the Anglo-Saxons, which became England, and then there was the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths, which were uprooted. 
And so this is the basic territory here of these division of these ten tribes. But what's important about this prophecy is not these four kingdoms and then the division of the fourth kingdom of Rome into these ten different tribes or ten different kings or kingdoms. What's significant about this prophecy is what happens next. Because we didn't see that in Daniel chapter 2, we're going to see this now in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. If you have your Bibles, let's turn there. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. I want to read it here. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So what does Daniel see happening next? A little horn coming up, right? So we have a little horn coming up. But this horn was different, wasn't it? This horn had what? Eyes like the eyes of a man, and it had a mouth that was what? Speaking great words as well. And so here we have a little horn. Now, what does this represent? What is this little horn? Well, those ten horns represented ten kings or kingdoms, right? And so this little horn would represent another kingdom that was coming up. But what John is, I keep saying John, this is not John, this is Daniel. What Daniel was seeing here was totally different from these other ten horns, wasn't he? He was seeing a little horn, but it rose among the other ten horns. And this little horn, when we look at it, this little horn is what we call today the Antichrist. Now, John actually called it the Antichrist in the, the epistles of John. In Revelation, it's referred to as this beast with seven heads and ten horns. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's referred to as the man of sin. And you talk to any Bible student today, and they're going to recognize these are all the same power here because the similarities are all the same. And so we could look at that, but we don't have time to look at all that tonight. And so he arose, this little horn arose among the ten horns. Now, what does that mean? Where were these ten horns? I looked at a map, and we looked at a map on the screen. Where were those ten horns? Europe, Europe basically, right? And so this little horn was going to arise from what we call today Western Europe. Now, this is important. Is the Antichrist coming from the United States? No. Is it coming from South America? No. Is he coming from Jerusalem? No. That was a trick question, I know. But it's not, right? So it's not coming from the United States, not coming from South America, not coming from Jerusalem. Where is the Antichrist going to come from? It's going to come from the territory of Western Europe because that's where the other horns were. It was rose up among these other ten horns. Now let's look again. We also read it in verse 8. It says that it arose after him. So there was another little, uh, as I was considering the horns, there was another little, uh, another horn, a little horn coming up among them. And so the other were there first, and it arose after the other ten horns. Another shall rise after them. So what does that mean? Well, you remember, Rome divided between about 351 A.D. and 476 A.D. Those are the classic dates that are given. And so it, this little horn is going to be arising sometime after 476 A.D. because the other ten horns had to be broken up into first, right? You following with me? So this was arising after A.D. 476. Okay, so sometimes if you talk to some people, they're going to tell you that the Antichrist is Nero or somebody like that. But did Nero come after 476 A.D.? No, Nero was in the 60s A.D. And so it's way before. And he wasn't a kingdom at all. He was just one of the emperors, emperors of Rome. And he was a terrible one, no doubt. 
Other people might say that the little horn, or that not the little horn, but the Antichrist is Antiochus Epiphanes. You don't have to remember that name. But you know when he was? He was 160 years B.C. Is that after 476 A.D.? No, absolutely not. These people do not qualify according to the prophecy. We have to see what the Bible evidence is, and they don't fit. Let's look at another point here. So he had eyes like the eyes of a man. Now, that's very interesting. Did any of the other horns have eyes like the eyes of a man? No, absolutely not, right? But this one had eyes like the eyes of a man. Well, what is that talking about? Well, you can look in the Old Testament. Prophets were referred to as seers. See this in 1 Samuel chapter... um, Trying to think where it is. About chapter 8 and uh, 7, 8, right in there, when Saul goes to see Samuel the prophet, and it says that they were seers. Why were prophets referred to as seers? Because they're enabled to see, not with human wisdom and human insight, but with divine inspiration, right? But this is not divine inspiration. This is eyes like the eyes of a man. This is human wisdom, human teachings. And so it was going to be uh, rely on human authority and leaders instead of on God. Let's look at another point here. This is also from verse 8. There's like 13 points. We're not going to look at all 13, but you can look at about 13 points of the little horn here. By the way, way, if you look at all the identifying criteria of the Antichrist or the beast or the man of sin, you can come up with over 50 or 60 identifying points. Don't worry, we're not going to be here till midnight, I promise you. (laughs) But there's a lot of evidence here. God is making it very clear for us. So it says he has a mouth speaking great things. Actually, I'm going to read verse 25 here. The first part of verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Now, the Caesars of Rome spoke some pretty blasphemous words. But this is going to be different. By the way, it says it's different right in Daniel. We already read it. This is not a, just a political kingdom like the others, but it's going to be a religious political kingdom. Why do I say it's going to be a religious political kingdom? Because it's speaking great words against the Most High. It's dealing with attacking the Most High. And so he's going to speak blasphemous words. We'll look at that. But great boasting claims for itself. Different from the other horns. I already said that one. A religious political kingdom. Now this is another interesting one. It says he was going to, he came up after the other ten horns. But what does it say he was going to do? He was going to uproot three of those horns, right? So catch this. This Antichrist power had to arise after, as a political entity, after 476 A.D., but it couldn't be too far after 476 A.D. because he had to uproot three of those first ten horns. So we need to be looking for this Antichrist power to be arising sometime shortly after 476 A.D., It can't be before the cross. It can't be one of the Roman Caesars. It can't be way into the future because then it wouldn't be able to uproot these ten horns. And so we need to be looking for this Antichrist power to be arising sometime in the Dark Ages, sometime after 476 A.D. Religious political kingdom making great claims for itself, arising from Western Europe, relying on human teachings instead of God's word. Very interesting, isn't it? A lot is packed into this little horn, isn't it? So look at a couple other points. It says in verse 25, we already read the first part, I'm going to read the second part here, Daniel 7, 25, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Going to be a persecuting power. So it's going to arise from Western Europe shortly after 476 A.D., a religious political power that's going to persecute God's people, not for just for any reason, but for religious reasons. 
Now, this is also interesting. Going to continue for a time, times, and half a time from verse 25. It's going to be hard to unpack this tonight. In fact, we're not going to be able to. I'm going to flip through a few slides quickly. We'll come back to this um, in a week when we look at the mark of the beast. But what is this time, times, and half a time? Well, we find this prophecy mentioned actually seven times in the Bible, in Daniel and Revelation. We have twice in Daniel and five times in Revelation. And so, and it's referred to by three different ways. Time, times, and half a time, 1,260 days, and also 42 months. What does this time, times, and half a time mean? Well, a time was one year, times is two years, and half a time was one and a half years. So this would be three hundred three and a half years, or 1,260 days. But there's an important principle that I'm going to introduce tonight, and we're going to see this principle fulfilled tomorrow night. We're going to read it from Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. Notice what it says. I have laid on you a day for, what does it say? Each year. Remember, Bible prophecy is given in symbols, right? And we allow the Bible to explain those symbols. And so here we have a day in Bible prophecy represents, what does it say? A year. And so instead of just 1,260 days, this was going to be, if there's 1,260 prophetic days, how many years is that going to be? A lot, you're right. 1,260 years, right? This is a long time period, isn't it? But notice the point. This is not one man. This is a system. It's a kingdom. It can't be somebody that's going to come in the future for 1,260 years. Aren't you thankful? Jesus is going to come before then. This is a long period of persecution. So this power was going to continue for 1,260 years, and it was going to intend to change times and law. It was going to attack God's law dealing with time. Now, as we think about that, a religious political power arising from Western Europe around the breakup of Rome, sometime after 476 A.D., that's going to continue for 1,260 years, that's going to be a religious political power, that's going to make great boasting claims, that's going to persecute people for religious reasons, and is going to attack God's law, and particularly the part of God's law that deals with time, we have to ask ourselves, who could this power be? Now, I want to make very clear before we go further that we are not against any person or any group of people. We love everyone, don't we? Jesus says, that you will know you are Christians by their love, right? By the love that you have for one another. And so we love everyone, and we respect everyone, and we appreciate everyone. And we are not against any person or towards any group of people. But if Bible prophecy gives us a warning, do we need to take heed to it? And so we're looking for a religious political power that last over a thousand years, arose after the breakup of Rome from Western Europe, persecutes God's people, and is based on human teachings instead of God's teachings. What power arose from the shambles of the Roman Empire after it fell apart? I'm going to let the historian speak, okay? Arthur P. Stanley in uh, Lectures on the History of the Eastern Church. As the Pope filled the place of the absent emperors at Rome, inheriting their power, their prestige, the titles which they themselves had derived from paganism, the papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. 
what came from Rome and lasted for this period was a church-state combination of the Dark Ages that claimed to be Christian but was persecuting other Christians. And so this church-state combination that was drifting away and falling away from the truth that God taught is what God is identifying here as this power, this antichrist power that was going to persecute and attack God's law. And we can see it in history today. We're not going to go back over all those points, but we know it's a religious political system arising from Rome in the Dark Ages after 476, and we could put all of that out. But I want to focus on what this power was going to do. Because that's really the point of this prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. What this power would do. We read it already, but I'm going to read it again. Verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. This power was going to intentionally try to change times and law. What is that talking about? I could go through and show a bunch of reasons why, but it's specifically dealing with the commandment that deals with time. How many commandments deal with time? Commandment that you shall have no other gods before me. Does that deal with time? No. Not committing adultery. Does that deal with time? Not bearing false witness. Does that deal with time? No. We go through all nine of those commandments. But there's one that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Does that deal with time? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. There's one commandment that deals with time, and that's the Sabbath commandment. And the Bible predicted that this power that would claim to be Christian but yet be drifting away from the truth of God's law and God's word was going to intend to attack God's law and particularly the commandment that deals with time. Has this happened? I want to go through some history here. So buckle your seatbelts. From as far back as we can go, the sun was worshipped as a deity. History, throughout ancient history, we see this. Here's a relief from ancient Mesopotamia. Notice the sun disk there above the king. This is from Peru. I was in Peru some years ago. And they're, they're actually their money is called so oh, I'm going to get it wrong, but sol, some souls, sons. And uh, here, notice the sun right above their god as he's rising from Lake Titicaca there. And notice the sun disk that he's holding or that has as a penchant right there. Notice these Egyptian reliefs. Notice this Indian sun disk behind. All over the world, the sun was what was worshipped as the primary god. It gave life and warmth and strength and to this world. Have you ever wondered why, how we got our names for our days of the week? We have Sunday, that was when the sun was worshipped. Moon day, when the moon was worshipped. And we could look at the other gods as well our English names. Notice Bible Cyclopedia here. Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. And so from time as far as we can go, probably back to the Tower of Babel, the sun was worshipped by those heathens. But God called his people out. He called them out of Egypt where they were worshiping the sun. And he set them apart 
and reminded them of the Sabbath. He gave them the Sabbath back in creation, but he reminded them of the Sabbath, gave it in the Ten Commandments, gave manna uh, to reinforce the Sabbath. Well, that wasn't the only reason. He fed them too, but it reinforced the Sabbath. And so here we have a small group of people, the Israelites, that were worshiping the God of heaven on the Sabbath, and the large group of people, the heathens, that were worshiping the sun. And the chief day of the sun was normally, vary with cultures, but normally Sunday. And this has went on for thousands of years, actually. You can, and you can see, you read Old Testament history, you see indications that when the children of Israel rebelled against God, they were falling into sun worship and the worship of the other gods around them. So you come down to Jesus' time, and Jesus keeps the Sabbath just like all the other um, uh, disciples do and the apostles and the early church keeps the Sabbath. But there's also the worship of the sun going on, but this time it's through Rome. And then, fast forward a little bit further, we get down to about the 300s. And Constantine the Great, or you want to call him great, but he was a very influential emperor. He tries to bring unity in his empire. And his mother was a Christian, and he it was, there's lots of things, the story of Constantine. He was fighting for Rome, and he saw the sign of the cross, and he heard these words in this sign, conquer. And so he baptizes his army. You know how he baptizes them? He marches them down into the river and back up out of the river again and says, okay, you're baptized now. And then he would give you, he would give people, if they became Christians, he would give them a new change of clothes and some money. Do you think they were becoming Christians because they were accepting Jesus or because they wanted to increase their wardrobe? <laughs> he used some underhanded tactics. And at the same time, he was building temples to the sun. But he was trying to unite his empire. And so one of the ways that he tried to unite his empire was he tried to unite the Christians and the pagans on a common day of worship. Constantine passed what we call the first civil Sunday law. Here is some of the wording of it. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. So he makes this law that if you're in the city, you have to close on the venerable day of the sun. Does it sound like he's worshiping the sun somewhere? Yeah, venerable day of the sun, right? You can look at some of his coins. These are archaeological coins. And you can even, if you can read it a little bit there, it says sol invicto comita, if you read around on it. Sol invicto comita means committed to the invincible son. And so Constantine, because the Christians, he was trying to unite them here, and there were some Christians that had already started to compromise with the pagans around them by worshiping both on the Sabbath and on Sunday. Here's Catholic Encyclopedia under the title Constantine the Great. Online, you can go look it up tonight. It is true that believers in Mithras, one of the gods, also observe Sunday as well as Christmas. Consequently, Constantine speaks not of the day of the Lord, but of the everlasting day of the sun. So you had pagans that were worshiping on Sunday, and you had Christians that started to compromise. Well, why were they compromising? Well, they didn't want it to be associated with the Jews because the Jews were rebelling, and so they didn't want it to have that association with the Jews. They were also, their neighbors were worshiping the sun, and they thought maybe if they worshiped on Sunday, that that would help to bring them in. And so what you really have in Constantine's time is you have a church-state combination. And the church yielded to the power of the state in this instance, then it started to exercise even greater power over the state, and accepted this compromise. Notice Historia Ecclesiastica. In the year of 325, Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, changed the title of the first day, calling it the Lord's Day. Have you ever heard of uh, Sunday being referred to as the Lord's Day before? That's not in the Bible. We read it in, in Mar uh, Mark chapter 2, 27, 28, also Matthew 12 and Luke 6. 
The Son of Man is Lord of what day? The Sabbath. The Sabbath is the Lord's day. But here we see they're trying to start calling the first day the Lord's day. And so you had the Sabbath, which was a holy day. But then they started to feast and do all these things on Sunday. It became this holiday. And then they started saying, well, you need to fast on the Sabbath. So imagine you were fasting on the Sabbath and feasting on Sunday. Which day would you start to like better? <laughs> the day you get to eat, right? <laughs> and so slowly throughout time, this compromise began to be accepted. Here's, here's another reference. Christians shall not Judaize or keep Sabbath and be idle on Saturday, but shall work that day. So slowly over time, we have this power starting to exalt Sunday and diminish the importance of the Sabbath. Notice this reference here. The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is in truth something royal kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. Now, what does that look like to you? It's a sun disc, right? Guess where that sun disc is? It's right there on top of this church. This is in Peru. And uh, we toured this church when we were there. And then we went underneath in the, there were catacombs, uh, burial grounds underneath the church there. And uh, you looked up from underneath and you could look up at the altar and notice what you see up at the top of the altar there, this gigantic sun disk. That's good. We, the grates are in the way because we were underneath in the, in the tunnels underneath there looking up into the church, but you could clearly see the sun disk there. You see how this sun worship became, started to get incorporated into compromising Christianity. Another sign there. What does that look like to you there? Yeah, sun disk, right? Notice, let's finish the quote. Hence, the church in these countries would seem to have said, Keep that old pagan name. It shall remain consecrated, sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, which is one of the Norwegian, uh, Nor Scandinavian gods, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. But I want to notice here, was it the Bible that said this? No. This was man that in the words of the prophet Daniel was intending to change times. And law. Is this recognized? Converts Catechism. Notice what it says right here. Which day is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Did God do it? Do you find it in the Bible? No. No. It was something that man did. Council of Trent. This was a long council uh, that was responding to the Reformation in the 16th century in Europe. And notice what it says here. This is a record of it. Finally, at the last opening of the 18th of January, 1562, all hesitation was set aside. The Archbishop of Reggio made a speech in which he openly declared that tradition stood above the Scripture. Now, I, I need to say right now that this is something that I do not believe. I believe that Scripture is above the authority of man. That Scripture is more important than tradition. But here in this great council, they said, no, tradition is above Scripture. And notice how they proved that tradition was above Scripture to their thinking. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by a command of Christ, but by its, what does it say? Authority. Own authority. Not God's authority. Not the biblical authority. Not what Jesus said. But man was attempting to change God's law. I see I'm out of time. Can I have about five minutes more? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the church had changed God's law. Here's another more recent book, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. 
Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday, yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath, or day of rest, was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. Are you honoring the one who rose if you, do what he, uh, if you disobey what he says? No. Is this recognized by Protestants? The Protestant acknowledgement. Of course, I quite well know that Sunday did not come into use in early Christian history, but what a pity it comes, branded with the mark of paganism and christened with the name of the sun god, adopted and sanctified by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. So this is Dr. Edward Hiscox. He was author of the Baptist Manual. She shall intend to change times and law. The question that comes to us is are we going to acknowledge the change of the power that Bible prophecy identifies as the Antichrist and follow its authority? Or are we going to follow the authority of the Word of God? Now, I realize that many people have never known these things, and there are so many wonderful Christians that are worshiping on Sunday and worshiping to the best of their knowledge. And I do not fault anyone. But I do want us to follow the Bible. Don't you want to follow the Bible? You know, sometimes we can follow tradition instead of the Bible without even knowing it. The story that's told of a guard that was standing guard over a lonely spot in the garden. Peter, the czar of Russia, went out and was walking in the garden. He says, soldier, what are you doing standing guard there? He looked down and it was just a little weed or something there. And he says, I don't know, sir, but I'm following my orders. He said, well, where do these orders come from? I don't know, sir, I'm following orders. And so he went back and he started researching. Year after year, a guard had been stationed to guard this bare spot of ground in the garden. He went back a hundred years to Catherine the Great, and she had had a prized rose bush planted there. That rose bush had died decades before. But the soldier was still there guarding that little spot of weeds. Not knowing why he did it. Just doing it because it was tradition. And how many today are guarding a tradition? What is our guide going to be? The Bible or tradition? I want to follow the Bible. There was a study that was done over the processional caterpillars. And these processional caterpillars will go around and it will follow in a line. There was a scientist that was studying them. He wanted to see how much they would follow this line. And so he put them in a circle, right around, right on a pot or a vase actually was what he was using. And so he, they just touched one another and they kept going around and around and around. And so he wondered how long they were going to do this. And they kept going around and around and around, following one another blindly. They loved the pine needles. That's what they would eat. He put pine needles there. He put water there. And they kept going around and around and around. One day, two days, four days, five days, seven days. They kept going around, starving, dehydrating, just following the leader. How many times do we just follow the leader? 
instead of the Word of God. Joshua said in Joshua 24, verse 15, Choose for yourselves this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to serve the Lord, don't you? Will you choose, I'm going to follow the Bible rather than tradition. I'm going to follow the Bible. Instead of, I'm not just going to be going around that pot following caterpillars just going around and around and missing out on the Word of God. Jesus calls us to follow Him. And I want to follow Him today. And I want to invite you to follow Him today as well. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you give us your word as a guide. We pray that you will help us to follow you. Not just to blindly follow tradition. Not just to follow what we've always done or what others are doing. But we want to follow you and what you ask us to do. Help us to be bold, to stand for you, no matter what. May we echo with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We pray that you will dismiss us with your blessing now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, Revelations Rapture. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, right here, Revelations Final Countdown. We'll see you tomorrow.